Yeah, good morning everyone. Good to see everybody out this morning. And happy Grandparents Day to all you grandparents out there. And for all you grandkids out there who forgot that it was Grandparents Day, you still have time. The day's not over. So happy Grandparents Day to y'all. Going to be looking at our bulletin, see what's going to be going on. I um, do want to remind everybody that tomorrow is 9-11. Um, I would encourage you to reflect uh, on that time and give it a time of quiet and meditation on that and also a prayer for our country um, with it being 9-11 and it's been quite a few years since then and we need to remember but we also need to remember that God brought us through it and God is still in control. Um, reminder of this week, um, there has been a change. There will be youth choir practice today at 5 o'clock. So those in the youth choir, I'm calling out for that. And reminder of church tonight at 6 p.m. And missionary Joe Bushy and his wife and newborn baby will be here. I do want to remind everybody that we will be lifting a love offering for Mr. Bushy and his family. So come prepared for that as well and be a blessing to them. Um, uh, ladies prayer group Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. If y'all have a, a visitation this week, no visitation this week, um, but do come out if you can for the Tuesday's prayer group, ladies prayer group at 10.30 a.m. Jam service on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. and then adult worship at 7. I encourage you to come out with there. Also a reminder, we are having a diaper shower tonight for the Boshi family. Uh, as newborn, I'm uh, trying to bring size one diapers out. And I don't know about y'all, but if y'all ever bought diapers, you understand how expensive those can be. So I would encourage you to come out and support them with that. Next Sunday will be our missionary, our missions offering, so remember that as well. Um, Anyone who would like to participate in our Christmas program in any way, please sign up on the sheet on the back table. Uh, Mama's been frantically looking at the plays that are out there. She thinks she's settled on one, so, uh, but I encourage you, if you're interested, we still need um, a body or two, so I would encourage you, if you can, to sign up for that. And then September 23rd, there will be a men's prayer breakfast, and it's to be followed by Super Saturday Soul Winning. Please plan to attend. I encourage the men to come out for that. It's a good time of fellowship uh, with one another and reflection with God, and, so, and good food along the way, and then the soul winning afterwards. So I encourage you to do that. And then the weather forecast for today. I like this. God rains and the sun shines. Expect showers of blessings. Every day, God is good. I like that. All right. All right. Do we have any other announcements this morning that I've forgotten? Well, do we have any testimonies or specials this morning? Miss Jewel? Friday, and he said, I told my mom about you. He 
said she couldn't believe that there was no people out there that cared. Mm -hmm. That's what's wrong with this world. Mm -hmm. We don't take the time to share the love that God gave us. What if we decided not to share that love with us? Right. Guess where we would all be? Yeah. There wouldn't be a heaven. There would not be a need for it. I'm thankful that God loves me and everybody that chooses to love Him. And if we could just turn around and love one another, lend that helping hand, be that voice, be that shoulder for somebody to lean on. Instead of saying when somebody calls, I'll take that call later, I'll call them back later. Then you get busy with life and you forget. You'll call them back. That might have been the last call that that person was able to make. Think with your heart sometimes instead of that old the gripping head that we carry on our shoulders that we only think about ourselves for. And I'm sure that God will make a difference in our lives if we choose to do what he says. Yep. And I'm thankful he chose me. Amen. Well, uh, Terry? I'd like to say I praise the Lord and thank you for his marvelous love and mercies. And, yeah, you look through life and you see lots of help and see other things. Hard days and hard days. God, God gives us a great will in life for our lives. Right. He gives us a permissive will. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our lives, we don't listen to God. We don't let Him direct our life. We get into giving some tough time. Yeah. But even if you're in God's direct will, doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems. Okay. Jesus was our example in all His life. He didn't sit here to say anything for Himself. And he did it all for us. It's crazy for His mercies, His love, and His gracious goodness, and just Him. If we didn't get anything but heaven, it would be worth it all. Amen. Give us all. If we lived a life of agony and misery and everything else in this world, then what more could He give us in the church? Right. Amen. Amen. Any others? Okay. Do we have any spoken prayer requests, Dr. Am I right? Remember to pray for Shirley and the needs she has. Also remember me too. Okay. John. Did you pray for my dad? Uh, for several days, his uncle with his cancer. Haven't heard much about that. I think he's had the treatment. I think it was, I think he's a trauma baby. For you to do it. Uh, I just want to say that you know, God was just, uh, remember, uh, well, about a year ago, I picked on Joel, said he was getting a horse, mm -hmm. he was getting spurs, mm -hmm. he was getting a horse now. <laughs> but uh, I was uh, just parking that on one of my third day with my doctor, and I was just lost the last one day. Okay. Any others? Ms. Helen? Remember my brother. Pray that you'll get back home safe and safe. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, Ms. Wallen. Others on my right? Any on my left? Can you remember Linda and I and the loss in our family? Can you remember my brother and the decisions and stuff that he has to make? Remember my daughter out in California? She ran into some pretty tough times right now, so she needs your prayer. Okay. Yes. And also remember to get to the city's uh, traveling in 
Sure. Any inspection or request for the upraised hand? Quite a few. This time I'd like to ask Brother Daniel if you would lease in prayer. Brother Daniel? Lord, I thank you once again for the house of the year, Lord. I thank you all that you've done for us, Lord, and what you're about to do for us, Lord. I thank you for our with the word this morning that may go and nurse our mind, our heart, our soul, Lord. We ask you to be with us and bless us out there in the world. Uh, bless the people that we can be with them, Lord. And we thank you for the time that you have given us in the last week? No? Well, we'll have our dismissal song for Sunday school. And if you've had a birthday in the last week and like to come forward and celebrate, come on up and celebrate. Alrighty, page number five in your hymnal. Jesus paid it all. We'll go ahead and sing that first verse, and then everyone can be dismissed on that last verse. We'll just sing those two verses. Uh, page number five. Sing it with me now. open your Bibles to Ecclesia, uh, Exodus again, Exodus 5, and <clears throat> I've been working on a chapter, uh, a chapter of time through the book of Ecclesiastes and picking up the main thoughts in that book, a uh, particular chapter of that week, and <clears throat> but Ecclesiastes continues on with another thought, and I just was remiss if I would pass on and not take some time and identify it. And I thought it would be good for a Bible study this morning. Ecclesiastes 5. 5. And we'll look at just the remaining verses of the chapter because there's a theme, a theme that runs here on. The first seven verses primarily deal with the issue of religion as we talked about this morning coming into the presence of God. But the last of the chapter, he he really changes, changes and begins to talk about living for money as opposed to living for God. And he, he just gives us, if you will, multiple reasons as to why living for money is really a bad thing to do. Um, I need not say much, but we understand who he is. He's a man that had a lot of money, had a lot, a lot, a lot of a lot, and made a mess of it. And now his last great work that he's involved with is that of the writing of Ecclesiastes. He calls himself the preacher, the debater. He's basically, it's like the elderly man laying on his deathbed saying, son, don't do what I did. Don't, don't live. Don't live how I lived. And this is what Solomon is saying. Solomon, because of the wisdom given to him by God, is, is far more understanding of our nature, was far more understanding of our nature than we perhaps understand. And this book is far more pertinent, being that it is God's words, and we perhaps even get credibility to it. 
we look at it and think it's an, it's an archaic book in archaic you know, language, a, cha a culture we're not even identified with, but these principles are so relevant for us today. So we're going to take a look at this, okay? Let's uh, pray and then we'll get into it. Father, we love you. Pray you'll bless our time. We ask you to bless the young people as they're in their Sunday school as well. Lord, please, 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 Lord, speak to us. We, we, um, we need you, Lord. Uh, how we're living our life in this world doesn't seem to be too good. We ask you to interrupt it, intervene. And help us, Lord, to find that abundant living you have for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, uh, if you were here, obviously <clears throat> you would remember I, pretty much the theme of the whole day was the subject of materialism. Brother Red had preached on it. We, in the night service, Revelations 18, we studied on it in regards to the political Babylon and its fall. By the way, pray for Red. They're going to be having services here in just a little bit. It's his first Sunday service with them. And so lift him up and pray for him. Uh, and so, really, this morning, we're just kind of capping, recapping this off from the most materialistic man who ever lived, and that was Solomon. And he's telling us in these, chat, these verses here that we should, not, we should not live for money. And we're coming up on that time of the year. Uh, when it just seems like it flies. And I was thinking about the whole, the idea of how time flies. You know, September until December, time just explodes. It's like a jet engine. And a lot of it has to do with the, the retail world. You know, we're, we're, we're still trying to enjoy summer, and they're trying to get us to think about Halloween. And uh, then at the same time, you're in stores, you listen to Christmas music and so forth. It has us looking so much, anxiously looking for uh, all these events that are coming up. And, and there's a reason. Now, obviously, there's reasons for that. They, we talk about Black Friday. How many of you participate in Black Friday events? Huh? I tried it once or twice, and that was a that was <laughs> that was a disaster. I, not sure why people do that, but God help you. If that's your, you'd rather go Black Friday as opposed to parachuting. I guess that's okay. That is dangerous. And uh, but Black Fridays have turned into Black weekends, and and they've really evolved into Black weeks, Black months. I mean. Really, the black year, you know, and we have uh, consumers that are so intent and so desirous of, of getting more things, you know, trinkets, things that are shiny, that buzz, sing, whatever. And you have retailers that want more money. This is a perfect combination for a hastening calendar and also for a, a near explosive fall and winter that's coming up upon us. I, I'm praying with all that commercialism that we we wake up at the end of the year and 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 wonder, you know, what was the whole purpose of these times of Thanksgiving and and Christmas, etc. And so Solomon, in turn, is really speaking to these retailers, speaking to these consumers, and he's making some very clear points. I would invite you to take a pen and paper and just write these things down. Notice here he says in verse number 10, it gives us a few points. In number one, he says this, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This also is vanity. The first thing he tells us why you should not live for money is because money will never satisfy you. I think in theory we understand that, um, but all of us have, all of us have this, I think all of us would have this temptation, I, I would at least like to try, <laughs> I'd at least like to try at least once, but Solomon saying money will not satisfy you. It was John D. Rockefeller who made the statement, someone asked him, said, how much money is enough? And he said, one more dollar. A man who was enormously wealthy and amongst the most wealthy, if you will, of the last couple hundred years. And yet, he said, I just want a little bit more. He had more wealth than what he needed to do with. More wealth than he could spend. It was just wealth really to be passed on to his relatives and to uh, organizations that he desired to have his money. But he, in turn, had somehow gotten in his mind that the purpose of getting money is just to let it pass through your hands. And money, it really didn't satisfy him at all. And so Solomon said in this passage that this also is vanity. This also is vanity. And so if one believes that, that the attaining of money or the attaining of silver and gold, as he words it here, is going to be that which satisfies you, you're, you're, you're tricking yourself. And again, I remind you who's saying that. 
It's a man who had it. He had more money than he knew what to do with it. He, he had so much money that the scripture relays that he stopped counting it. And then he was working to try to find purposes for it because he didn't know what to do with it. He said, but it didn't satisfy me. Now, obviously, uh, there's a benefit. Solomon had written in Proverbs chapter 30, which is a great principle to live by. He said, Lord, it actually wasn't Solomon, but it's written in the book of Proverbs. It was, it was Agur who said this. He said, Lord, he said, I'm asking you to give me enough so I won't despise you or forget you. I despise you. He said, but don't give me so much that I'll forget you. And that's a good, good pattern to live by. In life, we just we pray for what we need and not for what we necessarily want. And let God give to us over and above what we need as he sees fit. Now, why is that? Because Solomon is saying that these things will never, never bring satisfaction in your life. All right, look in verse number 11. He mentions another one. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saying the beholding of them with the eye? So why don't we live for money? Because money will not satisfy. Money will not satisfy. I have to say this. I was talking to a Nicaraguan man. He, he actually, his parents were actually... Um, uh, citizens of England and uh, they had moved and he was birthed there, raised his entire life in Nicaragua and so he he was very much uh, you know a Nicaraguan as far as his culture and language and so forth but he also was had very much western thinking he was in his thought process and he was telling me he says you know um, he said people in Nicaragua were so much happier before all the western influence came, American in, you know, States influences came. He said, growing up, he said, I mostly grew up barefooted, uh, but I never had a thought that I was poor. He said, uh, we, we really just, our main goal was to have three meals a day, and we really valued or evaluated our wealth based upon the fact that we had three, three meals a day. And he says, now everybody complains about being poor, and everybody wants wealth, and everybody wants riches, and nobody's happy. He's an unsafe man. He didn't know Christ. But it was interesting. I listened to him. I thought, man, this man, it sounds like he's almost verbatim speaking what Solomon had said. You know, he said, I had so much joy and contentment as a child. He said, but I didn't necessarily have wealth. And uh, he had something, I guess. Maybe it was his relationships. Maybe it was some freedom. But he certainly has learned in his lifetime as he's watched others that money cannot satisfy you. The second thing he mentions here is that when you get more money, there's more expenses. Can I get amen on that? Yeah, more money is more expenses. Notice how he words here in verse 11. When goods increase, they are increased to eat them. Boy, isn't that true? <laughs> there's moochers that show up. And the moochers may be taxes. Uh, the moochers may be... Uh, people that are lobbying, the moochers may be expenses that come about because you have more money, it may be that because you have more money now that you, you involve yourself in a bigger car, a nicer car, or whatever may be the case, but nonetheless, uh, you have more money, therefore you have more expenses, and so when it's all said and done, the, the profit margin is not as great as when you were poor, perhaps it's the same as when you were poor. And Solomon had a lot of wealth, but he's acknowledging, he said, I've got a lot of expenses. I pay a lot of men's salary that I don't necessarily have to have, but I have because I have a lot of money. I've built a lot of palaces that we don't necessarily need, but I've built them because I have a lot of money, therefore I need a lot of men. And he said, I need a lot of this, a lot of that, a lot of that because I have a lot of money. And it's true that as we increase in our life, then we tend to change how we live our life, and therefore we need more money uh, to live that type of life, and, and we find ourselves really not quality-wise living any better than a person that's poverty-stricken because we have more expenses. And Solomon said it's really not a good thing to live for money because uh, if you live for money, what you're going to find out that you just have a, a lot more expenses, and it, it almost becomes a rat race, doesn't it? You know, you, uh, you're working and working and working to pay bills and pay for this and pay for that. And many people start businesses with the idea to get ahead and make more money on to find out that they have a lot more money, but they have a lot more headache, a lot more problems, a lot more expenses. Everybody wants money from them. 
And uh, when it's all said and done, they were a lot better when they were working $15 an hour at a, you know, another shop or whatever. They didn't have all that. And that isn't the sign of a person who's lacking initiative. That's a sign, that's a sign of a person who's identifying what's important in life. So, separately. Number 12, verse 12, he says another thing here. The sleep of a laboring man is sleep, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. And so we shouldn't live for money because money will not satisfy you. We shouldn't live for money because money brings additional expenses. You don't necessarily get more money and keep the same expenses. We shouldn't live for money because... <clears throat> Money will cause you to lose sleep. It will cause insomnia. Um, we uh, hear all the advertisements of medications and drugs and different things that people will take so that they can get a good night's rest. People will pay a ridiculous amount of money. They'll go into stores and buy mattresses uh, that cost thousands of dollars and it's for the whole intent to rest they want to rest and there is there anything that becomes more precious to us as we age than a good night's rest it's it's precious um, oftentimes we travel we sleep in different beds we don't enjoy them we can't wait to get home because we want to get a good night's rest and we value that and Solomon is saying here that that money in turn is, is really going to take your sleep away. He f begins by saying a man who labors hard. This is a guy who works in a fields farm. Somehow he does physical labor and he exhausts his body. He goes to sleep and he sleeps really good. He said, but here you have a man that has a lot of wealth and all of his abundance. He said this abundance that he has of wealth, he said it actually takes away his sleep. He's taken away because he is worrying, he's concerned, he's anxious about his investments, he's anxious about all of his responsibilities, and he's stored up all of his wealth, he has all this wealth, he's trying to manage all this wealth, and he becomes really concerned about protecting all of this wealth to the point that he loses a good night's rest. What a tragedy that is. You see, this is why we should not live for money. He goes on to say in verse number 13, notice here, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. As he came forth of his mother's womb naked, shall he return to, as, to go as he came, and there shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil, that in all points he came, as he came, he shall go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? All of his days also he, he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. And so here, you see Solomon moves from, you know, a proverb style of writing to more of a story, and, and he's telling a story, really a tragic story of a man who made a lot of riches in his life's pursuit, and that's these verses which we read, verses 13 to 17, and yet he learned some lessons along the way, and one of the lessons that he learned was that materialism is really, really bad for you. Notice in verse 13, there's a sore evil which I have seen under the heaven. That's the, that is what he's identifying. This, this pursuit of money and wealth and you know, materialism, if you will, he said it's a sore evil. It's, a, it's severe. It's a sickness. And this misfortune Solomon is about to relate to is so terrible that he, he even goes on to say it's sickening. He said it makes him ill to even think about it. So what happened? Well, there was a man who guarded his riches, and that's the meaning for the word here you see, uh, that he kept for the owners thereof, and he kept these riches. And this guy really was just a, a regular old Scrooge is what he was, and we have a good visual about Scrooge and the whole storyline behind that. And he in turn lived, he gathered his wealth, he protected his wealth, he squashed anyone who tried to take away or minimize his wealth and 
certainly in time he suffered or felt the suffering from uh, from uh, from this spirit, if you will, this sore evil, this severe evil, the sickness that he have of materialism or wealth, because it's always bad for you. You, know, you, you live for materialism or you live for wealth, it's going to take away your health. If you live for wealth and you live for materialism, it's going to take away your relationships. How many marriages have we heard of that have struggled and have fallen apart all because of the pursuits of one or the other for the issue of more wealth? And so you can do studies on the Internet and find out about, you know, just... People's pursuit of, of wealth, and they go by way of careers. They can make dollar amounts, climb the, the corporate ladder, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and get more, 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 so they can have more. You know, as a friend of mine would say, how did he say that? Brother Tony G would say, he said, you get all you can, you can all you can get, and then you sit on the pot. And uh, that way you try to protect. You know, sit on the can. You can all you can get. You know, so, you can't. You get all you can. And can all you can all you get, and then sit on the can. And he said that's really the that's really the motto or people's life. They just get everything they can get, and they try to keep everything they have, and then sit on it and protect it. What's bad for you? And this is what Solomon is telling the story of this man. He was keeping wealth, but the result of it was is that it just it was bad for him. It was a sore evil. It was meaning it was a sickness, and it affected this man's perhaps his health. It affected his relationships, and we would not have to think hard or long before we could identify people of such. How many stories, books have been written of people? How, how many movies have been made of such, of people that were, you know, they were cured of their sicknesses, the sore evil, because they just released their wealth and let it go. Uh, and they realized that it was bringing great sickness into their life. All right, so we're talking about why we should not live for money. He goes on to say, here in this story that he's telling, uh, notice, if you will, verse number 14, but those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. And so, uh, very simply, it's all going to be gone. I mean, wealth, wealth, easy come, easy go. Uh, just a simple gamble one day could be so risky. Uh, the risk could be that you, you lose everything, a bad activity a habit or business that you start and the, the road goes out from underneath it and uh, obviously money is similar to life in that it's a vapor and it's here today and it's gone tomorrow and, uh, and then we're on the cusp of even things changing perhaps with the world economy and things changing with our government I mean, I mean seriously yeah, it's money you know if you have it today thank God but there's just no there's just no guarantee that you're going to be able to keep it. No guarantee. It's why our faith really should be in God and we should live for God because when money fails or money disappears, our God is still there and he never fails. And he will take care of take care of us. And so we have a have a lot of joy and a lot of thankful thankfulness for that. But he also goes on to say this in this passage, verse number 15. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, neither shall uh, 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 take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And so the next reason he mentions here is that you're not going to take anything with you. Did you hear about the man who, who was wealthy and he was a little jealous over his wealth and he told his wife, he says, honey, when I die, he said, I want you to promise me that you'll take all of my cash, all of my money, all of my wealth and put it inside of the casket with me. And she in turn said this to him on his dying bed. And there was witnesses that listened to her make this promise to her husband. Well, the service in turn pursued and people were were coming by the casket and they looked in the casket and there was no cash in there. There was no wealth to be seen inside of there. And finally, one of those who witnessed the promise that she made uh, asked her, said, uh, I thought you promised that you would put all of his money inside the casket. She said, you know, I thought that through. And she said, I decided that I would just write a check for everything that he owns and I put it inside. It's in there. It's inside the casket. <laughs> and so she uh, obviously was trying to keep it for herself as well. But the money's not going with us. It isn't. And so today you die, tomorrow you die, and then what? You know, it's, the, it's the big, Mr. Bill Bigger Barnes. You know, he, he had a lot, and then the Lord said, Today thy soul shall be accounted. Then who's all these things going to be? The money doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter at all. Uh, will not matter at all at that point. So money has a purpose. It has an intention. I, I'm not insinuating that we should live on welfare. <laughs> you know, that we should bum. You know, that we should go around and mooch off everybody. I'm not insinuating that. But we don't live for money. Money is what we have to use for the purpose of living. It goes on in a hasten here. Um, verse number 17, verse number 16, th uh, and 17. And this also is a sore evil that in all points as he came, so shall he go. What profit hath he that labored for his son, uh, uh, labored for the wind? Again, identifying that the money is going to leave you. Why don't we live for money? Number 17, verse 17. All his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. So this is the sickness in verse number 13. It's a sore evil. This is the sickness of someone who's chasing money, living for money. And it's why even as parents that we need to be careful that when we're encouraging our kids about taking steps out of the house and going the direction in whichever they want to go, that it's bathed in prayer, that it's not bathed in reviews and consumer reports and looking at the market. We want to lead, the, lead our children to realize they have a responsibility of taking care of themselves, yes. But we don't follow the dollar bill. We don't follow it. I was um, part of a funeral service by one of my aunts and uncles, great aunt and great uncle, it was two weeks ago, I guess, in, in Princeton. And they had the, uh, the VA show up, Veteran of Foreign Affairs, and they did a presentation. It was the most thorough presentation that I had ever seen. Very moving. I was teared up through the through. It was very, very good. They explained everything and why they do it. And uh, they sent very kind words. And I was just thinking about a day and a time where people went in the military because of patriotism. I just don't know when I've met someone who was going to the military today because of patriotism duty and honor. You know what they say is, and I'm not thinking if it's your child or somebody, I'm not even thinking of anybody, okay? But they're going there because it's a great, great career choice. And I can get this and I can get that and I can do this and I can do that. And by and large, that's, that is the pacifier that we have fed our children. The stepping out of the adulthood, stepping out of the childhood into adulthood. As we have given this pacifier, which Solomon here identifies as a sore travail. We've taught them to chase. Chase after materialism. Chase after money. Get all you can. Can all you get. And then sit on the can. Not on the pot. I said the wrong thing earlier. So sit on the can. You get all you can. Can all you get. And then sit on the can. Because he that dies with the most toys... Not wins. Yeah, loses. And so that's what he mentions in verse number 17. This person's miserable. The miser. The miser really is a miserable person. They're just so concerned about their money. And I invite you to think about that novel written by Charles Dickens again, Ebenezer Scrooge, as he defines that. And really, he did a wonderful job of, of personifying, if you will, culture in his pursuit of money and his love for money and his love of materialism. And what happens, it makes a miserable man. Think of the people that are happy in your life. Think of the people that you rub shoulders with that seem to be free and enjoy themselves. And so think of them. I think you'll find that most of them are not happy. Or most of them are not rich. All right. Look, if you will, in verse number 18. We're almost done here. Verse 18, he says, uh, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor, that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is a portion. And it's true that God wants you to enjoy the good of your labor. You're a steward of it. You don't live for it. We live because of it. It's what enables us to live, but we don't live for these things. And so, it's true. We, we should be a good of labor. Enjoy the good of our labor. Yes. I mean, with, obviously, within, within a good judgment. 
Verse 19, every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and have given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is a gift of God for he shall not much remember the days of his life because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. And so I want you to see here, lastly, this is the eighth thing that he mentions here, verses 18 through 20. He says, really, he says, you shouldn't live for money because there's a better way that you can live life. You don't live for money, but money enables you to live. You live for, you live for bigger things than that. You live for God. I mean, you, you live for the purposes such as the Great Commission. You live for relationships. And you live to, to build and to grow the people that are around. You live for other things, but you don't live for materialism. You don't live for money. There's a better way to live. And if God had not provided for me uh, monies, then in turn, I would not be able to take care of a wife that I love and take care of children that I love. But then I don't live for that. We should not live for that money. Monies is what God gives so that we in turn can live a better life. Yes, that's what I'm talking about, preacher. If I have money, I can get a little Rolls Royce. If I have money, I can take... No, that's not what I'm referring to. You know, we, we God gives us by way of the labor monies so that we in turn can live a better life. And a better life is not seen in the house or the car or the clothes, but a better life is seen in that which is internal, that brings true contentment. And that's the purpose of living, which is God and the will that he's called us to. And Solomon here is saying, I just, really, I'm reading between the lines when I say this. I just made a mess of my life. I had all this money and I could have done so much good. But instead, I wasted it. I thought I'd always have it. I thought it's what I was supposed to live for. I lost all kinds of sleep. In turn, I just made myself miserable trying to mise over all of my money. And he said, I could have lived the greatest of all lives because I had so much money that I could have used to live what life is really about. So I guess what we should, reading this, we really should go back and do our homework and figure out what is life really about? What should we really be living for? Then we could perhaps figure out what the purpose of money is. All right, I'm letting you out two minutes early. But I know no one will thank me. No one will appreciate that. I don't want to. Yeah. All right, let's have prayer and let's be dismissed. We love you, Father. Thank you for your goodness and faithfulness to us. May you help us to carry your words with us and to meditate on them. May you change us because of them. Please be with our friends and our, our family that is not with us today, our shut-ins. And please comfort them, we pray in Jesus' name.